This is Internet Marketing. Brought to you by Site Visibility at sitevisibility.com. This is Internet Marketing. Now, before we start today, we have a request. If you are genuinely enjoying what we do here on the show, please leave us a review on iTunes or your podcast app. It really helps us to grow the podcast and ensures that we bring you great marketing tips and advice each week. Now, today I'm joined by John Henshaw, co-founder of Raven Tools. John, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm very, very well. And I'm very, very impressed that you have got up so early because you're sort of near the east coast of the U.S.? Uh, yeah, right? I'm, yeah, I'm uh, an hour difference uh, from the East Coast, so yeah. about 5 a.m. <laughs> so it's it's 5.20, folks. He's up at 5.20 a.m. just to speak to us. So we should be very, very happy about that. So, um, so yeah, I'm excited about today's show because we haven't spoken much about um, – op- um, I'm not going to say optimizing. I'm going to say making your site fast, site speed. That's a good way of putting it. So we're going to be talking about that today. But before we do, John, just tell us about yourself and Raven Tools. Yeah, so uh, I would say well over 10 years ago, I co-founded Raven Tools. And it was originally focused on SEO. And we kind of expanded it into social and paid. And today it's used by uh, thousands of, of marketing agencies for their reporting and managing their campaigns. And uh, a little birdie told me that you've recently sold Raven Tools. Is, is that true? And what are you doing now? It's absolutely true. <laughs> and uh, in March of 2017, yeah, uh, not too not too long ago, uh, we sold it to a company called Tapclix, which does an uh, enterprise uh, version of what Raven does. And so it was a really good fit and really happy for them to take it over. And I am now a senior SEO analyst at a company in the United States called uh, CBS Interactive. And then I'm also kind of working on something new on the side called Koi Wolf, which will be coming out probably around January or mm-hmm. February. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah, we will do. Now, speeding up your site, I want to get into the, um, I always use this phrase, phrase, meat and vegetables. I think it's a very British phrase of, of this subject. But before we get into that, you, I know that you've mentioned this acronym, called AMP, which to me just makes me think of electric current. But it's something you, you, you're very excited about, and it's very relevant to speed. Tell us what AMP is, AMP. Yeah, well, well, by excitement, you, you, you probably mean um, not excited about <laughs> but I'm excited about not being excited about it. Okay. <laughs> so, so AMP, uh, what it means is accelerated mobile pages. And ah. uh, where it comes from is Google. And even though they like to tout that this thing is open source, it really is very much controlled by them and uh, is in their own interests. <laughs> and so what it is, is as digital marketers, we have basically ruined the Internet <laughs> and, and particularly ruined it from a, a UX standpoint and from a speed standpoint so that you go to just about kind of any big page and you have tons of ads and the sites aren't very optimized and they're slow yeah. and and they are very spammy and you have things that are popping up in front of your face oh, and, and, and they're just difficult to use and so uh, G- google decided that they would uh, fix that themselves and and created something called amp which is essentially a sort of an offshoot language from html that is very very controlling and and part of what it is is they basically force you to not use JavaScript. They force you to present it in a certain way, uh, which is like one column. And and then the real gotcha is they, at least for now, they host it. <laughs> and so it's, it's one of these things where you essentially take your content, you put it into their format, hmm. And, and then they host it. And then there's this giant, giant carrot that they're using to get people to move over to this, which is they say it's not a ranking factor except for the fact that uh, when you're at least on a mobile device and you search for something, particularly news, they have this carousel at the very top. And they're pretty much just pushing 
amp results. So even though they say it's not a ranking factor, it's pretty much a ranking ranking factor. And um, most big content media companies have started using this because they don't really have a choice. I mean, they've mm. they've made they've it pushed it so hard on publishers that they're going to be losing out. And I'm, by losing out, I mean probably millions of page views, if not more, if they aren't using this particular technology. And the problem is, is that it's very, very Google centric, as I've kind of described, yeah. and and it doesn't really solve the problem. And I was I was recently at Brighton SEO giving a presentation, and I sh- and I showed people how publishers have already broken it. <laughs> and, uh-huh. and what I mean by that is, I I showed the audience a Forbes result, um, so for off of Forbes.com and. There was no distinction between the sort of presentation and amount of ads and everything that AMP was supposed to fix from the AMP version that Forbes was pushing uh, live. I mean, it looked just like the old broken, you know, just ad infested, uh, ad overlay, everything type of sites. <laughs> right. And and so and so the only thing that AMP was actually doing at that point was serving ads faster. So 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 it just makes me think that's kind of the ultimate goal for Google is yeah, to yeah. everybody use amps amp so that you can serve our ads faster. Um, so, so um, there you go. Is it, do you think amp isn't very good or well so the problem is is that we don't need amp. We we already have the existing technology that has been Running the web at least in a browser since the beginning. There's uh, the current current HTML works perfectly fine. In fact, that's what AMP is based off of. Yeah, it's what what needs to change is how people build their sites. Uh, people need to kind of take a step back and and focus on speed and UX, which is really at the root of what is what is good about AMP. So so it's not that AMP is all bad. I, I think that possibly some of the engineers and the people at Google who were behind this originally uh, were very well intentioned. They were basically saying, here's our example of sort of the perfect web, the perfect experience when you are consuming content and maybe need to still deliver some ads. But that is not exclusive to AMP. And, And really, if publishers would actually look at that and go, you know what, that's kind of what we need to be doing. We need to find that happy medium. Yeah. Um, and revisit that, then they can do that with today's HTML and yesterday's HTML. They don't need uh, sort of that offset language of AMP HTML to be able to accomplish that. Which is actually a very nice segue into, because I want to focus in on a couple of main areas here. I want to talk about the the actual code on the site. I'd also love to talk about images. And if we've got time, we'll just touch on UX. But going back to the, the, the code in a site, tell us about that, because there must be ways of sort of refactoring the code and doing it in an efficient way. I know I've looked at the because because I'm a geek. I've looked at the uh, source of many sites and just very quickly flicked off again because it's actually quite frightening. But tell us a bit about the, the best way to sort of um, organize the code in a website. Absolutely. So you know, p- part of the problem is that because of broadband, we've gotten really lazy. Yeah. And uh, particularly people who are web designers and, and web developers, we got we got really lazy. And also because of CMSs like WordPress and all the things you can do with it, that also made us fairly lazy because before you kind of really had to hand code this stuff and you, you had to have somebody who really knew how to build this stuff out. And now pretty much any of us go and uh, with a press of a button with a particular hosting provider, just have WordPress live going to uh, any number of People who sell WordPress themes, we can just kind of pick the one that looks the prettiest and says SEO on it and download that and add that. And then once you do that and you activate that theme on WordPress, Mm. it then says, um, great, thank you, and go ahead and download and activate these 10 plugins. (laughs) (laughs) And so so before before you know it, a a typical site, and, and, and you have to remember, you know, a huge percentage of sites on the internet, I think it's something it's beyond 25% now run WordPress and, and are in this situation. They are, are, they have this type of, of structure. And, and so what you have is you end up having what I would call code bloat. Mm. You have, um, uh, you know, WordPress out of the box is not 
that SEO friendly. Um, these and themes that say they're SEO friendly aren't that SEO friendly. They have a ton of things going on, a ton of JavaScript libraries they're using, um, excessive amount of CSS. Mm. Um, and then you add these plugins on top of it, and they have their own JavaScript libraries. And, and again, before you know it, you've got a site that's megabytes <laughs> to <Yeah>. download <laughs> just the, with the first visit on any page. Mm. And, and so that's fine if you're on desktop and you have broadband, but it's not fine in this sort of brave new mobile world where you don't, you don't really know the uh, speed of the bandwidth you're going to have. And, and if you even consider just a, a sort of emerging areas and, and countries that are just sort of getting online and, and maybe don't even have broadband or, or their main source of access is a mobile device, um, then they're the ones who are suffering. I mean, you're suffering because they can barely load your page. But they're the ones that are suffering from that. And so um, the number one thing that, uh, at least the place I, I recommend people start, is to actually go and look at all the code that you're running on your on your site and try to consolidate and, and kind of refactor the code that's in there. So, for example... A lot of people are probably running different versions of the same JavaScript library, say of jQuery, mm. when they really only need to be running one. Um, and then in addition to that, most people aren't even using hardly anything that comes with jQuery. They're maybe using jQuery because it does this one really cool transition, but that's only just a tiny piece of that library. And and instead of serving the entire JavaScript library, find out the the piece that is actually being used and only use that. And then you can take it even a step further, which is a lot of people will have a particular page or process on their site that does this one cool thing. Well, it ends up, you know, you only need that code for that that page or those pages that use it. Hmm. Uh, and so why are you making every single visitor who might be viewing, viewing the other 95% of your site have to download this giant library for this one instance, and so so there are things like that. There, it's it's a it's a bit of a laziness. It's a it's a bit of um, we've kind of created this monster ourselves um, as far as making it so easy to be able to get sites up and running and doing things. And and what we need to do is we need to take a step back and and then kind of and kind of clean house. Now, John, I really wanted to talk about images because I've seen many a website where um, an image, like you, you go to the homepage and there's an image perhaps in the background or something, and it takes about 30 seconds to slowly build up line by line on the, on the screen. <laughs> so um, let's talk about images. What, what's the, I mean, is this a common problem? I, it seems to be for me in your, your uh, experience, is this a common problem getting images wrong? It is, you know, and it's funny because it's 2017, and we also haven't figured this out either, <laughs> yeah. in general. And and it's and I would say that similar to, you know, the bloated code problem, uh, it's related. The fact that images aren't optimized on most sites today is related to that, which is we've we we got broadband and we became lazy. We didn't, yeah. you know, we there was no perceived problem on a fast connection in your desktop browser and we didn't realize that we were ruining it for everybody else who is uh, accessing it on say a mobile device and yeah. maybe on a slower connection and so uh, with with images it's kind of interesting uh, I, I think that a lot of people thought they solved the image problem as it relates to mobile when they made their sites responsive and the problem is, is that has nothing to do <laughs> with image optimization, especially mm -hmm. from sort of an SEO standpoint and from a speed standpoint. And and so, um, and the reason for that is because all a responsive design does is it it literally re resizes the image, but it doesn't change the actual size. It doesn't change the kilobytes yeah. of that image. It just makes it fit on a smaller screen, but it's still that giant image. Mm. And and so um, one of the biggest things that most sites out there could do um, is, is optimize their images. And there is a way to do this. Um, uh, fortunately, in the more recent builds of WordPress, it's actually – a part of the core codes. So now featured images and, and images you add to it mm. will actually 
implement this thing called source set, but there's still a lot of people who, uh, because of the way they set it up or not using WordPress, that that it doesn't use this yet. And so yeah. what source set does is it's a, uh, you know, source set is a very technical term uh, for HTML. If, you, if somebody does HTML, then they'll, they'll kind of understand it. But source set is this attribute for images that basically serves different images based on both the device, uh, the screen width, and also the definition of the screen. Yeah. And so, so with that, it can actually say, "Oh, you're, you know, you're only so many pixels wide. I'm going to show you this smaller version of the image, yeah. um, as opposed to the giant one." And if it detects that it's uh, in the Apple world, you know, they call it Retina screen. If it te- detects it's Retina screen, it will actually show the higher res version of that smaller image. And so. Um, you're actually showing them the most optimized image, both from a UX standpoint and also from a speed standpoint. And so a lot of people don't use that yet. Uh, a lot of even web designers and developers, that is a foreign uh, source set is a foreign term to them. And it shouldn't be uh, because that's what they need to be doing today. And it's what they really need to have been doing uh, the past couple of years uh, after yeah. it became a standard. So so source set is is definitely something that people should look into. But there's one thing about it that I really love. And, and, and again, it, this goes back, I would say, more to UX than even speed. And that is, it, it, source set doesn't have to just show a smaller version of that image. It can also show a completely different image. And that's really important because not all images that get resized uh, are really, yeah, are yeah. really appropriate yeah. on a mobile device, mm. especially has text and little items and stuff yes, like that in there. Yes. And so... And so one of the things I like to do with SourceSet, and this is the type of a thing that you can't automatically do with WordPress, is actually serve a completely different image. And so I've done this in the past, uh, particularly at Raven, we did this uh, study uh, based off of, off of our site auditor data. And we made it so that we had this kind of complex image kind of infograph that we were using that looked great on desktop. But of course, if you build it, it, it looked horrible. <laughs> you, you couldn't see anything. And so we had our design create a completely different image based off of that kind of, you know, taking out things and kind of reducing the content, but keeping the core parts in it and, and made it so that if I viewed this on my phone, um, it was still completely relevant and it looked really good and I can read it. And so that's something you can use with source set. And so you're, you're, you're sort of taking care of two things. You're taking care of um, both speed and also improving the user experience when they're they're view, viewing that image on that content. Yeah, because this notion of like showing different images depending on the device you're viewing it on is very interesting. There's an overarching thing here, isn't there? Because there's um this there's two there's, there's optimized images and there's responsive images, aren't there? Just just briefly, you've kind of already told us, but briefly tell us what the difference between responsive and optimized is. Yeah, so with a responsive image, all you're doing is you're taking that same large image and you're just making it smaller so it fits onto the screen of the mobile device. But with an optimized image, it's actually doing something, like I said, with source set and uh, basically delivering the image that's actually smaller and potentially different. Uh, But there's also one other thing that I think people still don't have uh, a really good grasp on, and that is the type of image. Yeah, and yeah, and and so that can have uh, play a big role in the actual size of the image. So, for example, I think most people don't. First of all, they probably don't even know what it is, <laughs> let alone that they should be using it. And that is uh, an image type called an SVG. Right. And and really, an SVG image, they there are two types of images. There's one called vector. And it's based on math. And there's one called raster. And that's the one that we were most used to. That's Those are basically JPEGs and pings. Those are yeah. raster images. And, and those tend to be used for photographs and images because they're really good at compressing complex colors and data. Mm. Um, but the vector images are really, really good for images that are, are simple in yeah. nature. Yeah. And and so when I think of that, I think of like a logo, I think of icons and that type of thing. And and those are the perfect image type 
um, to use on a web page when uh, when you have a logo or you have icons because they're tiny. They're super tiny. It's literally just text mm. because it's really just math. Mm. And 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 what's what's really perfect about them is that they will scale uh, to any size and will have perfect resolution on any screen. And yes. so that's why yes. that's why I like them the most. I like using yeah. vector images the most when I can. But again, you can't use vector on a complex image or it gets a little crazy. <laughs> you know, yeah. at that point you yeah. really just need to use a JPEG or ping. And and so um, I generally recommend that the, the you know when when somebody is looking at the images to use as they're uh, building content or building a page, the first one they look at is, can I use an SVG? And if the answer is, no, I can't, <laughs> because because the image is, is too big, then the next step is, can it be a ping, a PNG? Yeah. And and then if it can't, if the image is even way more complex, like I said, like a photograph, then the last choice is this JPEG. Sure. And that's kind of the order that... I recommend people going uh, through, again, both from a speed and UX standpoint. Reluctantly, I'm going to leave images behind. I could talk all day about images, but just just a quick word. Just want to briefly touch on UX user experience. Uh, John, have you got any quick thoughts on that? I do. And, you know, UX is Im- important in ways that I think a lot of people forget about. I, I think that uh, one of the things that Google showed us with sort of their their AMP implementations, at least their original implementations, was that uh, at the end of the day, your visitors desire a good user experience. And one of the things that I did in my presentation at Brighton SEO when I showed that Forbes article, you know, how, look, they just ruined it, so obviously AMP isn't the answer, mm. is, I, is I also showed an example that wasn't using AMP that was a good example of sort of what the web experience should be on mobile. And that was from a, a site called Vice, which is a, a US-based um, sort of news media uh, company. Mm. Uh, and it was their news site. So it was news.vice.com on a mobile device. And they were using just plain old HTML the way I think it should be. <laughs> and and all they were doing was they were presenting the content in one column, which is what you should do. And they reduced the amount uh, of ads and the way you experience ads on their site. So it's not like they went away, but it was a good user experience. It was very clean. It was really easy to read the content without being constantly interrupted. But I also was able to uh, see the ads when I probably should see the ads, but I was also able to read the article when yeah. that's why I was even there at the page. And, you know, and then at the end, they can show me more ads. Uh, and, and so there's a lot to say about UX um, in regards to that because I think that the there's room for people to compete and to win by improving the UX of their sites. So if you're thinking – man, you know, I have this, it's really hard to compete against um, these sites over here. Well, it ends up that that you can because the UX on their sites ultimately is is not desirable. It's not enjoyable. Um, and and I'm sure any one of us, who, you, know, any, you know, who is listening to this right now can say, you know what, yeah, there is a particular site or sites that if I really think about it, I don't go to as often anymore or I don't like to go to, mm-hmm. even though they're big sites. Mm-hmm. Because I hate it every time I go there, especially on my phone. It is just a struggle to even read the article. Yeah. Well, there's your competitive advantage right there. Yeah. Not only can you speed up your site, you can improve the users. And what will happen is as people experience your site versus theirs, it'll be, it'll, it'll have such, you'll have such a better impression of it. And it'll be such an enjoyable experience that the next time you are doing a Google search and you see, you know, a person sees your site and sees your competitor's site and they remember having a really good experience on your site, there's a much better chance they're going to click on your site. Not to mention that you might even improve in ranking if you just speed up your site and make it work better. So if you had uh, one top tip or a sort of key takeaway for our audience today, John, what would it be? I would say that my favorite tip is a tutorial 
that I made maybe about a year or so ago. And one of the the great struggles <laughs> has been um, as sort of a, a web guy is getting SSL, <laughs> getting yeah. my site secure. Mm. It has traditionally been a complete pain in the butt and you have to order a certificate and you have to know how to do some technical things. Uh, it costs money. And there is a, a service called Cloudflare that has taken out all the pain. <laughs> They've made it completely free. And on top of giving you uh, free SSL for your site, this is any site, just a blog, a, a one-page site, anything that you're doing, they also give you uh, something I haven't talked about, which is HTTP2, which is a new protocol that, that basically uh, makes delivering all the assets to a browser mega fast. Mm. And, and it's, it is the future. I mean, everything's going to be moving to HTTP2, except for a lot of the hosting providers still don't provide it yet. But yeah. you can get it now, and you can get it free, and you can get SSL for free uh, if you go to this tutorial that I made, which is basically it's raventools.com slash blog slash free dash SSL dash HTTP2, and that's a really long one. I'm sure you'll put it in the notes somewhere. I will um, instruct site visibility to put it in the show notes. Yeah, there you go. Yes. Um, and, and this is not, there's no money being asked. This is not a ploy. This is not anything. This is literally just something that I have, that I use on every single site that I have that is, to me, the answer. <laughs> and this is something I literally use on everything. Um, and the fact that it's free and that it works so well, I just, I can't tell enough people about it. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for joining us today. Um, how can our listeners find out more about you, more about Raven Tools? Yeah, absolutely. So Raven Tools uh, can be found at raventools.com. And uh, if you want to find out more about me, uh, say hi to me or follow me. I'm, I'm on Twitter at twitter.com slash Henshaw. Uh, that's H-E-N-S-H-A-W, isn't it? Yes. Fantastic. Perfect. Well, thanks for listening, folks. The show notes are in the usual place, sitevisibility.com slash podcast. Um, again, if you join the show, please leave us a review. Uh, if you want to send us a suggestion or a question, podcast at sitevisibility.com is the email. Um, at sitevisibility um, is our Twitter handle. Um, don't forget also that we have a site visibility group on LinkedIn. I think that's everything. So it's goodbye from me, Andy, and it's goodbye from John. Great. Thanks for having me. And we'll see you next time on Internet Marketing. Mm-hmm.